We recording? Regular Joe here. Um, the old media tends to call me Joseph Gordon-Levitt, that being my name and all, but I go by regular Joe. I acted in this really fantastic, huge Hollywood movie called Inception, and it's all about dreams. Dreaming is something that's always fascinated me. If we all spend on average like 20 years of our lives asleep, that's, that's about five, six years that we all spend dreaming. And man, that's a lot of time that, that I could be, you know, I could be alive. We continue going about our days and sleep to contrive innovative dreams. Anyone who wishes to interpret the dream must himself be on approximately the same level as the dream, for nowhere can he see anything more than what he is himself. Well, what is exactly going on here when I'm asleep? And why, why do we dream? And, and what is it for? And, and what can I maybe get out of it? I'm hoping that in working on this documentary right now, I can maybe learn a thing or two about dreams. I got started smoking years ago when I was a young man. And uh, I finally got to the point of a, almost a chain smoker. And somewhere in the 50s, the Surgeon General you know, announced that cigarettes cause cancer of the lung. And I tried to quit. Then I, I developed a chronic cough that smokers had. One day I was coughing, and I coughed up into a handkerchief, and it was pink. And a chain smoker could only mean one thing, cancer of the lung. And that's a death sentence. And the, the despair I felt and the self-hatred, you know, I, I should have quit. I won't see my children grow up. I just incredible despair. And then I woke up. And the, the dream was so real, I, I didn't smoke another cigarette. I call it the dream that saved my life because I probably would have kept smoking. Freud's dream theory was basically the idea that dreams are the royal road to the unconscious. His whole idea was that the unconscious, the tip of the iceberg, is of course consciousness, and everything underneath is unconsciousness. He, however, viewed this sort of suppressing this unconscious material is because there's all kinds of unresolved, libidinal, instinctual, yucky stuff down there. We're less likely to see that today. Yes, a whole lot goes on unconsciously, but a lot of it's just a much more efficient way to process information. He brought attention to dreams, uh, put importance on dreams, but he also pathologized them. And that's too bad, because they're not. They're perfectly normal. He thought that we only dreamed when there was a conflict. And that's one thing that the physiologic research really showed that Freud was just dead wrong on how often dreams are happening. They're happening with great regularity for everyone, whether we recall them or not. When we go to sleep, uh, our brain deactivates. Everything goes down on slow running. It's almost like we're hibernating, so to speak. Dreams happen when the brain is reactivated. Every 90 minutes, approximately, the brain becomes much more active. The eyes start moving around like crazy. And that's basically when most dreams occur. REM sleep is also called paradoxical sleep. And it's a good name for it because it's a state of the brain in which the brain is turned on as, as much as it ever is, but it's detached from the body. Why then do you see when there's nothing there? How can we explain the fact that you feel like you're moving even though you're not moving? And the answer is very simple. The brain has a virtual reality generator. It generates sensory stimuli for itself and it interprets them for itself. This is imagination. This is what this is all about. It's about conscious imagination. Dr. Stephen LaBerge has a phrase, this three pound universe. The brain creates the world and we're conscious of the world. In REM sleep, we aren't getting any help from the senses. And that to me is a miracle. I see a lot of commonality between just being creative, whether, whether that means, you know, you make movies or you write songs, you draw, you write, whatever it is. That kind of creativity, I feel like it's very connected to dreaming. Every night the Auburn sun tucks in her children one by one. Ever since Freud, we've thought that dreaming was an unconscious mental state. It is not unconscious. 
it is highly conscious, and it is, in fact, a state of consciousness that precedes waking consciousness, because in development, in, in utero, you're certainly REMing. We know that fetal states are mostly REM, and obviously the brain is getting ready to be conscious, and you're probably doing something like dreaming, although I'm not suggesting that you're having anything like adult dreams. If I want to look at the neurological activity and comparing a dream to waking, they're largely the same. Because the brain can't tell the difference between dream input and waking input. Dreams are as real as waking life. People will wake up and they'll say, I can't believe that was a dream. I had a dream that I was approaching a kindergarten classroom and I saw rows and rows of desks that were empty and just one little child sitting in the front. As soon as I sat down, the teacher turned around and she had red lights instead of eyes. She said in a really deep voice, stop trying to forget the baby. And I looked over at the little kid next to me and it was me. What's always been interesting to me about dreams and about dreaming is that unlike other forms of psychological distortion, whether it be memory loss or psychosis or uh, hallucinations and so forth, dreaming is a very positive, healthy experience. And it's one in which somebody normal with an ordinary uh, mental process is allowed to uh, view the world in a particularly distorted and surreal way. And sleep does have that sense of losing control as we spin into sleep because we are, we are losing control of our, quote, mind at that particular point. When I was doing a laboratory sleep research, I would stay up all night, so I sleep deprived myself. By morning, I was very, very prone to have somebody walk in the door of the lab. There wasn't anybody there. I was hallucinating. I was having sleep onset hallucinations. Those hallucinations, if I was sleeping normally, would be contained in my dream world. Freud and Jung both said that let the dreamer awake and you will see psychosis. In your dream, you have the capacity of seeing things that aren't there. If for reason of sleep deprivation, drug taking, or bad genes, you have that dream experience during waking, you will call it psychosis. And that's what psychotic people experience all the time. They experience waking consciousness as if it were dream consciousness. Their waking consciousness is dream consciousness. Every brain has within it a psychotic a potential. That doesn't mean it's sick, but every person certainly can become psychotic, and every person does become psychotic every night of their life. It's normal. When you go into REM sleep, there's basically a part of your brainstem that suppresses muscle tone. When that switches off, we're essentially paralyzed. We can't move. What you can do is move your eyes. You still have control over that. The function of the paralysis mechanism is so that you can have these emotionally engaging experiences, but be safe. I've certainly had the experience of still being subject to the paralysis, but actually waking up in the real world. And for an instant or two, uh, you can't move, and, and that is certainly very frightening. You know you're paralyzed. You know you're awake, you know you're in your room, you cannot scream out, you cannot move. Uh, UFO abductions are often attributed to this disorder. If you wake up from a dream and you're breathing hard, and your heart's going ding, 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 that's REM sleep. If you have an asthma attack, it's out of REM sleep. Uh, stomach acid secretions are up 20 times in REM sleep. So REM sleep is pushing the body while it's paralyzing it, thank God, because when that paralysis mechanism cuts off, people act it out, and that can get dangerous. One of the most famous cases happened where a man had REM sleep disorder. This is a young man who uh, was very much enamored of a young woman, wanted to marry her, and the parents were opposed to the marriage. This happens in reality. 
So she, she's, uh, she starts to act nervous and shy, and he realizes he's going to lose her. So he's a sleepwalker. He's been a sleepwalker all his life. So uh, he's going home in his car, and he hears on the radio that these two people have been killed with a hammer. And he says, I wonder if I did that. Because the two people are the parents of his girlfriend. Okay? So he calls the cops and he says, you know, I'm, I'm really worried about these people. I think I might have done this thing. How could you do this? You, you, were, you weren't awake? Well, he says, no, and his, his, his defense uh, for the jury is that he was sleepwalking the whole time. 30 mile drive in the car, bludgeons them to death with a hammer, gets out of the, gets out of the house, goes back home, and hears the report on the radio. The jury found him not guilty by reason of sleepwalking and automatic behavior. He got off because the law states that you have to have conscious will and you have to be in control. The attorneys questioned them and said, could he have done this thing in his sleep without knowing it? And the answer is yes. I find that literally trying to recall dreams or trying to relate a dream experience, I find that to be really impossible. It's such a subjective and personal experience. It's very difficult to translate it into words and have somebody else be able to follow it, which is one of the reasons I was interested to make a film that would try and portray dream states. Even back in the, the early non-talkies, it seems like almost every special effect that came along got, got tried out. Just the feeling that something is happening that couldn't quite happen in waking life uh, is what these things seem to conjure up. Over the years, people have tried to dissolve, or they've tried more surreal transitions, but I think the simple cut in film grammar is one of the, the closest uh, film tricks to the way the brain actually thinks, to the way you actually perceive the world. We've tried to really push the limits of how you can use cuts, how you can use the most simple cinematic transition there is, to take the audience from literally one state of mind into another state of mind. Taking on the challenge of a, doing a film that's set within a dream state, it wasn't that far off for me from what making movies is, <laughs> if that makes any sense. We all have to take on a sort of alternate reality and put ourselves in different character shoes and sort of be in different environments that are a dream every time we make a movie. For me, one of the key components of, of dreaming uh, is that you don't feel yourself enter the dream. You can feel yourself come out of it. You can very specifically wake from the dream and know exactly at what point of the dream you've, you've woken from it. But for me personally, I would never feel myself entering that state in a conscious way. And so in portraying dreams and the entry into dreams in the film, it was very important to me to try and really do it the way it felt. And the way it feels to me is that you find yourself in the middle of a situation, in the middle of a, an environment. And then as the experience ends, you become aware of where you are physically in, in the world above the dream, if you like. Uh, and so the way we portray the entry into dreams is we, th we throw the audience into the middle of an experience and then they become oriented through coming out of that dream. When we look at the dream life of people in general, the emotions are mostly negative. They are mostly sadness, fear, most of all apprehension or anxiety, and we'll throw in confusion, puzzlement. And that's why, another reason why I say we tend to dream, dream worst case scenarios. There's certainly some fairly common dream themes. The recurring dream that I have the most, which is a classic universal dream, is anxiety about schoolwork and being back in high school and not having done any of the coursework for an exam, but having to take that exam. And the classic experience is uh, falling and waking up before you hit bottom. I went to school and, and uh, I suddenly realized that I'm only wearing my underwear and everyone else is fully clothed. Half or more of people will say I've had that dream at least once, a dream of being in public inappropriately dressed, of their teeth falling out, a dream of, of flying under their own power. Bad dreams are very common. Uh, anger attack dreams are very common. 
one evolutionary theory is that uh, dreaming helps us to practice dealing with threat in a safe place while you're asleep. Uh, and that then once you rehearse running away from the saber-toothed tiger, you're better able to do it you know, when you're awake. These are important uh, instinctual acts, being able to fight, being able to run away, being able to be afraid, as well as you know, being able to be friendly. Life is a, a constant negotiation between these emotional states. And dreaming, I think, reflects it very clearly. You could be a human being in, in any culture and not know the other person, and yet we have the same dreams. Human beings are bound together by dream consciousness in this way. It signals, really, the bond that unites us all. There are different ways to interpret the dream, that people are naked in front of a crowd and feel exposed. This is a very collective dream, but the Jungians would interpret all dreams in terms of how the soul can develop. And so this is about embracing the body, embracing your full self, but also learning to set clear limits and boundaries in your life so that you don't feel exposed or don't feel uncomfortable. The Native American version of that is that Native Americans connect everything to oneness, to the earth, and how we're all connected. And so I think the interpretation would go around how to be reverent to the body and how you can create a life where you feel comfortable in your body and use it as a temple for the spirit. I kept having this repetitive dream and I had no idea why, but it was just me alone in the dark and I used to see a silhouette of a man and I never saw his face and he was always kind of far from me until one day he just appeared right in front of me still, could not see his face, just his silhouette, and he embraced me. And the feeling that I got was just this love and, and almost like a complete safe nest, I guess. And I woke up thinking, well, that's kind of weird because I, I don't know who he is. I've, I've never seen his face, so it must have been like maybe a few weeks later. I met a guy, <laughs> and our first kiss was exactly what I had seen and felt in the dream. Maybe something or someone was telling me, hey, you're, you're gonna meet that one guy. We were married about six years ago, and now we have a two-year-old daughter. Emotions obviously drive a lot of our, our being, and REM sleep dreaming is the time when we try to regulate that. I've certainly dreamt about my, my dad after he died. It's certainly very nice to see somebody who you've lost again in the dream state. And I think partly um, that's one of the benefits of dreaming, is that it allows us to experience positive things as well as negative things. I dream quite a bit about people who are gone. A very close friend of mine came to me in this dream and it was as if we hadn't lost him yet. And we're hanging out and I remembered, oh, that's right, Chad died. I thought, oh, wow, this is my opportunity to save my friend. And I remember grabbing Chad by the hand and saying, I have to get you to the doctor because this is the second chance. This is, I feel like we have a second chance. I have a chance to save you and I don't want this to get away. And then finally he said, I appreciate that you're trying to get me to the doctor, but it's not going to make any difference. My dreams are so real that they can be very upsetting when I wake up and I realize that all of the things that I thought were possible, they're not. The film certainly deals with the idea that in a dream you can re-experience your time with somebody who's either passed away or is no longer around. There's a sequence in how memories put together this startling new information he's dead with all of this history of wonderful interactions with my dad. Memories do that by initially making a mistake. Oh, hey, wait a minute, he's alive. Well, no, he's dead. And eventually, over time, we put together the he's dead with the memories of the love that he had. That's what REM sleep or dreams do. In waking life, we learn the language of logic. 
We learn how to solve problems using the typical functions of the brain. How do you pass a test? How do you cross the street? How do you raise a family? And it's so useful. But dreaming is very different than that. The linear mind, the analytic mind, the logic is shut off. So you go into a whole different realm that conveys information in different terms, in terms of imagery, in terms of symbols. I've always found dreams to be a pretty fascinating creative space in terms of uh, taking the pieces of the real world and mixing them up into bizarre combinations. By shifting the pieces around, it helps you feel differently about a project you're working on or something you're doing. And I've always valued that sort of creative arena. The ideas about dreaming that I've been fascinated by that I've tried to put into the film specifically are uh, things like I've always felt that my brain was working even faster than it can do in waking life. It, it feels to me that time passes uh, more slowly in a dream. I would drift off for 10 minutes, but I would have had a, an hour long dream. There have been a lot of attempts to influence dreams, and the most frequent way to try to influence them is through some sensory stimulation. Uh, you drop a little cold water on their back, uh, you tickle them, you whisper to them, play a bell. Occasionally, one of those stimuli will get through. Now, when it does, it's often then incorporated in a very interesting way, a very creative way. And so the bell becomes, uh, you know, some part of music. But the important thing is that those sensory stimuli are not triggering dreams, they don't easily get into a dream. A dream is pretty autonomous. And when they do, the dream just assimilates it. I mean, our mind just puts it into the ongoing narrative. What's shocking to me is the detail with which the mind can create a world that you think, when your mind thinks, is only uh, perceiving it. In other words, you create the world and you perceive the world simultaneously in a dream. Everything you dream is you. It's something that you're making. Anything you see, anything you hear, you've created that. Or anybody you talk to, that's you playing that character in your dreams. It's just something I identify a lot with because I play all sorts of different characters all the time. It's like what I do for a living. And the notion that when I encounter somebody in my dreams, I'm not just encountering somebody else, in fact, I'm sort of talking to myself, playing somebody else. And to me, that creation of a world uh, on, a, on a subconscious level that you're able to experience as reality, that speaks volumes about the infinite potential of the human mind. That the brain has a mind of its own. The brain is a filmmaker. The brain <laughs> shoots, rolls, directs, script writes, edits, does everything all at once, automatically, every single night. Have you ever like heard music in a dream? Well, you were making that music. You were composing it and performing it all at once in your dream. There are some musicians who have said, I have dreamed new tunes. And one case, a person woke up and he uh, said, wow, that was great. I wonder if I ever heard that. And he played it and then he played it for his friends and they hadn't heard it. And he decided, maybe I dreamed that. And his name is Paul McCartney, and the song is Yesterday. One of the important sources of innovation in human culture has been dreams, that ideas coming from dreams. One of the best examples is Otto Loewed, and he got a Nobel Prize for this idea which came to him in a dream, where he dreamed about this exact idea of an experiment to do, and he woke up in the middle of the night and had to go to the laboratory and do it. It's similar to the famous example of uh, Jack Nicklaus golfer who had experienced a slump in his performance and had a dream in which he discovered what he'd been doing wrong exactly and then woke up and said, ah, that's exactly it. If I'm learning a part, I can only study so much 
before it's not useful anymore and I have to go away from it. Especially if I sleep on it and come back to it, I'll just know it. The brain is working on stuff even when your, your conscious individual ego self isn't telling it to. We have seen that when somebody is having a very specific kind of dream content, such as dancing or dreaming about math, that exactly the brain areas associated with those things are lighting up. Dreaming is a sort of practice state. You're running the programs for waking. When an animal is learning something very definable, like moving through a maze, you can measure the pattern in the brain. And then we've seen that the animal will show that exact same pattern in its REM periods. So the assumption is that the animal is dreaming of going through the maze correctly. If you learn a task and you sleep, especially in REM, you're likely to do better when you retest it. And that's a very important concept, that REM sleep is probably responsible for uh, retaining a learned task, but also improving its skill. In collecting dream journals from literally thousands of people over the years for various experiments, I've seen where some people have a dream and they wake up and then something bizarre begins to happen and they get this funny feeling they might be dreaming and then they wake up again and some people have chains of these. I have at times experienced the idea of waking from one dream uh, but not fully coming out of the dream state and realizing that I'm actually in another dream and then coming out of that. What's interesting to me about that is the idea that we can dream a dream within a dream. That to me suggests this infinite potential of the mind uh, and I think the limitless nature of that is pretty fascinating. I've always wanted to be able to have lucid dreams. Lucid dreams means that you know you're dreaming while you're dreaming. Then you have choice. Then you're able to do things that you couldn't have done if you didn't know it was a dream. When I first started my research, the consensus uh, among scientists was that lucid dreaming was impossible. The basic way I proved that lucid dreaming was a reality, that it actually happened, was to uh, arrange for a recording in the sleep lab where you put electrodes uh, that measure eye movements and brain waves on the scalp and muscle tone of the chin. So the idea was I would agree before going to sleep that tonight when I am dreaming and realize I'm dreaming, I'm going to send a message. And I'm going to do that by moving my eyes left, right, left, right, and back. If you see the REM tracings, it's like this is, you know, it's very clear, really easy to identify on the EEG pattern. You couldn't believe how long, how many years it took sleep researchers to go, no, no, it's not possible. You can't possibly be awake while you're asleep. Well, actually, yes, you can. And that proved that lucid dreaming happens. One of my favorite things in movies, too, is when a character knows that they're in a movie, like looks at the camera, it's kind of like lucid dreaming if you know you're in a dream. But I think I'm awake right now and in a movie. Hey. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Joe. Steven, glad Pleasure to meet, to meet you. you. Welcome to my dream. <laughs> Thank you. Are you awake yes. or are you dreaming? So this is something that you can do. You can have a, a lucid dream. I'm sure. It's a matter of just recognizing while it's happening. This is a dream while you're in it. When people are first learning to fly in their dreams, they do all kinds of things. Learning they say to fly. like like I Superman, want to do this you know? So much. Like right. you know, they, they try a big jump, right? Mm. You know, or flapping wings or whatever their models of how do how would I fly? I will just lean forward and spread my arms and, and I just kind of lift off the ground. And when I fly, I don't really fly like Superman, like at rocket speed. I just, it's just kind of this drifting, you know, kind of soaring kind of thing, so it's nice. When I go to bed, I actually look forward to it, so it's a bit of an escape. There are like many vacations. So it's a personal uh, art. It takes, takes training, takes work and, and practice, and you get better at it. It's an and, art. And, yeah, it is. is. Usually it will start off where I don't know I'm dreaming, 
and I'll go through it for a while and then something will happen, like an event. Like maybe I'm running and I trip or something and that trip will signify to me that you're dreaming. And then from there, I just kind of take the reins and go with it. For example, I had a dream that I was like a ninja assassin and I was taking out a bunch of bad guys to get to the, the head boss. And I made it through all the, the, the bad guys and I get to the boss and I notice that I'm outnumbered. He's like pretty strong. And I told myself, I need backup. And then I just imagined back up there, and then we just took him down. <laughs> a particular study was recently done in which lucid dreamers practice a coin toss experiment. And maybe 20 tosses, you get two or three in. Uh -huh. it's, it's not an easy task. Right. Then you practice that in the lucid dream. And what they found was that you get an improved performance, wow. which is to say that you they are They got better actually, at doing it yes. by practicing it in their dream. That's it. People use it for entertainment, uh, fun, uh, flying dreams, uh, dream sex, doing what you want. An important application is also overcoming nightmares. Some people are, suffer so much nightmares that they don't want to go to sleep, particularly post-traumatic stress nightmares. If you know you're dreaming while you're dreaming, you can control the dream. It seems to be the key to recognize what they are, face the fear, work through it, and then you're free of it. In Tibetan Buddhism, for example, is a, a yoga of the dream state where for a thousand years they've used lucid dreaming as one of their methods of seeking enlightenment. They speak about lucidity as an early sign of the development or evolution of consciousness. So it's a, a way of seeing what is it like to awaken to a broader, deeper, fuller sense of reality. It provides a model for awakening. It, it primes the higher development in people. You certainly could have more lucid dreams. Yeah. Uh, no, no question. All you have to do is sleep with the mental set to do so. The first step then is, is to increase your awareness of dreams. So sleeping with the idea, tonight I'm doing something besides just checking out from the world. Sleep to dream with the intention to Tonight dream. I'm going to be having dreams. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. and that's the first step. So you, it's, it's about keeping your focus while you're falling asleep? Is yeah. that what you're saying? Secondly, to look at your dreams for dream signs, for things that happen in the dream that could tell you you're dreaming. Some uh -huh. of the things that occur in dreams don't happen in waking reality mm -hmm. or are unusual. That could tell you you're dreaming. Right. And then you become lucid. What I'm taking from this is the most important thing to do is to just commit to trying to do it. Yeah, that's how you're going to get there. It's clear to me that a dream is, is an experience of the mind, but it's not possible to dismiss an experience of the mind as unreal. When you dream or when you imagine things, there's reality to that. If you're dreaming about your relationship with a person and what you think of that person or ways in which you, you interact in the dream, the emotions we experience are real. They're as real as the emotions experienced in the real world. There's no more proof for these things in the real world than there are in the state of the mind. That is where emotion takes place. Consciousness most simply is usually separated into well, sleeping and waking. Then there's all these transition states. Daydreaming. This is not a task-oriented kind of consciousness. This is where you let your mind drift falling asleep, the hypnagogic state, feverish states, virtual reality kinds of states. Fantasy, there's uh, hypnosis, meditation. The consciousness of leisure time, play. And it turns out that these transition, not sleeping, not, not alert, waking, focused, in fact occur and account for some huge amount of the day. I've heard figures as high as 50%. You have to sort of be aware of the camera and what's going on with that, but then you have to largely ignore it and you're being somebody other than you normally are. I spend a lot of time in that sort of dreamy place. What's interesting to me about film noir characters who either have memory loss or, or distorted perceptions for some reason is those characters make it immediately apparent to the audience that they cannot perceive 
the objective reality around them. That's true of all human beings. We are all uh, imprisoned by our own subjective perceptions of the world. And I think storytelling is one way in which we can understand a different point of view on what we consider to be objective reality. I think that one of the most powerful illusions of the human experience is the illusion that we're seeing objective reality through our own perceptions. We can only see uh, what we see. Lots of people have drawn the metaphor between dreaming and movies. The, the first theaters for showing films in Europe in England were called dream palaces. Just the, the analogy that, that you're watching these hallucinatory vivid images kind of passively in the dark uh, seems, seems true of, of both things. For me, going into a movie theater and sitting down and after about 10 minutes you finally relax and kind of merge with the screen. It's so exciting, it's so scary, it's so happy that you just are part of what's going on around you. I think that pleasure derives from feeling less isolated as human beings. I think that pleasure derives from feeling part of a shared experience with, with other people, uh, stepping outside the, the prison of our own perceptions, uh, if only for a brief period of time. There's a certain magic, I suppose, that happens when you're making movies that when you're an audience member being able to be you know, visually stimulated, it tells the story through pictures in a way that you can never do through words, that you can never articulate. You can't ignore the fact that if you can conceive of something, if you can perceive it or experience it within the mind, then on some level uh, it, it exists. I'm studying hardcore gamers. That is, they play uh, very frequently, they play long hours, they started really early in their lives. They're embodied in that virtual world and they flip back and forth from it. Yeah, mom, I'm not now, you know? And I'm looking at how is it affecting their consciousness, uh, specifically on dreams. Those kinds of highly intensive, uh, focused uh, kind of gaming over long periods of time is essentially a meditative practice. And some of the consequences that you would see with meditation you're seeing in gamers. We found that they have more lucid dreams, uh, which isn't terribly surprising when they're in alternative realities for hours a day. And we also found that their nightmares are not like uh, what we see in uh, non-gamers, and that is they're empowered by the threat and the chase, just as they are in a game. They've practiced fighting back all day long or for hours, for years, so that right away that well-learned response happens in the dream. It says something about the power of shifting realities on these deeper unconscious processes. And I think that has implications for the evolution of consciousness. West, we have a very externally oriented view of reality. How much stuff do you own? The chair is hard when I touch it. And anything that comes from inside of us, we minimize and dismiss as not meaningful. While in many collectivist societies, it's quite the opposite, that inner realms are very important. They view dreams as alternative worlds, as parallel universes in a sense. A window to communicating with ancestors, to some other dimension of reality. The sufficient scientific evidence that says consciousness is not just in our brains, but it's in the world around us. And thus we have telepathic experiences, we dream of something that comes about, we have all kinds of different states that we experience. I used to have this dream from when I was a kid where I'm standing at the top of this pit and there is this person down at the bottom, it looks like a shadow, and they're just surrounded by snakes. And at the last moment, when this person is about to be attacked by the snakes, I grab this vine and swing down into the pit, grab that person and bring them back up. And that would be the dream. So I tell my mom this dream. And she turns to me with like, <laughs> just like a ghostly look on her face and goes, I always have this dream where I'm the person in the pit 
And at the last second, this person swoops up and saves me. <laughs> we were just like, what? I'm not saying that it's not possible to share dreams. In fact, there is a case in which we do share dream worlds. There are? Yeah. That's what this is. In my view, what we're experiencing right now is a kind of a dream. Oh, it's okay. in that it's all a dream. You know, it's the idea of life is a dream. It's an idea that takes a little getting used to because we're used to the external reality being independent of us, doesn't depend on our perception of it. But the world of consciousness, the, what we experience, I see things, I hear things, I feel things, that, I'm saying, is a kind of a dream. Whether we're awake or dreaming asleep, our brain is making an image of the world. And what we actually experience is our model of reality, not reality itself. Perception is dreaming constrained by sensory input. So it's a constrained dream. Whereas dreaming is perception free of constraint. What exactly is the difference experientially from the dream and the waking state? And you see, it's the same stuff. It's all illusion. Just being a person is a creative process. Every dream is a work of art. The brain has a massive area of mystery to it that I think is best seen through dreaming and through the dream state. Dreams help solve certain kinds of problems. They help lay down memories, for worrying about threats, for fantasizing things we want. I think we're just discovering how many functions there are to dreaming and that they may be every bit as broad as the functions of our waking thinking. These dreams, while we sort of think of it as, oh, you're transported to this other world, what's actually happening is you are expressing yourself in just the freest, most potent way you could imagine. My favorite quotation is by an author of long ago, Havelock Ellis, a dream is real while it lasts. Can we say more of life? <laughs>